Thanks for listening to the Mornings with Carmen LaBerge podcast, made available thanks to support from listeners just like you. Helping you wake up, remembering this is our Father's world. This is Mornings with Carmen LaBerge on Faith Radio. If we're gonna fly, we fly like eagles, arms out wide. If we're gonna fear, we fear no evil. We will rise by your power. We will go by your spirit. We are bold. If we're gonna stand, we stand as giants. If we're gonna walk, we walk as lions. Hey, hey, hey! Good morning. Good morning. I'm Carmen LaBerge. You're listening to Mornings with Carmen on Faith Radio. Hey, friend, where do you live? Where do you live? Now, let's think of all the ways we might answer that question. You can go ahead and text me. The text line's always open, 877-933-2484. Where do you live? Is your first inclination uh, to answer with, like, a city or a state? If you know I'm in the United States of America and you're not, is your first inclination to answer... Oh, I'm. Uh, I live in Kenya, or I live in uh, South Korea. Uh, I live in Belgium. Like your your first inclination might be to offer up your nation if you know you are living in a uh, another part of the world than the one I'm coming to you from. If you live in the United States, and your inclination might be to answer that you, uh, you know, you're checking in today from Alaska or California or uh, Montana. Good morning, Billings. Or maybe uh, you are listening in Simsbury, Connecticut. Oh, wait, we dropped a city in there both times, Billings and Simsbury. And so you say to yourself, okay, well, uh, maybe she knows what state I'm in, so I'm going to answer with my city. Only if we are, like, in the same city do we start offering up, like, parts of town, right? So if I were with you, like, sitting together right now, in Duluth, and I said, hey, where do you live? You might answer with a part of town um, or some sort of reference point. But there are lots of other ways to answer the question of where do you live? Some people live in reality and others in fantasy. Some people live increasingly online versus, you know, IRL in the real world. Where do you live? We all live east of Eden. That would be one way to answer the question. Another way to answer the question is, you know, I live, um, I live in Christ. I, I live and move and find my being in Jesus. I live in the truth. <laughs> That's true. How about you? I live in the truth. How about you? This question emerged as I was uh, digging around with God in his word today. So let's get into the Word of God, that the Word of God might get into us before we get out there into the world that God so loves, so that we might do so in ways that honor Jesus. Our Growing Your Faith verse of the day comes from 1 John. If you're not already signed up, you can sign up for the verse of the day in your inbox at myfaithradio.com. Today's Growing Your Faith verse of the day comes from 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. And I want you to think about where you live, where you live as we read these familiar verses. If we claim we have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves, and we're not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to God, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. There's so much packed into these verses, and they are so relevant to the challenges that we face in America in 2024. Well, really, in the world in 2024, no matter where you live. And let's just pause there. Doesn't that amaze you? Doesn't it stop you in your tracks that the God of the universe, the God of the universe, the one who sees the end from the beginning, knew that you and I would be talking today? Of all the days in all of human history, God knew that you and I, of all the people in all the world, in all of time, that you and I would be talking today. And in all of the ways that people can talk to one another, God knew that you and I would be talking today of all days, you and I, people of all people, talking with one another in this way. Right now. (laughs) And he knew what we'd be facing in the world. 
God doesn't have to like scroll, scroll Google to find the news of the day. He doesn't have to put keywords into the search engine. God knows what we're facing today. And he knows that we need to hear from him. And so the God that always has been and, and is and ever will be offers us his word. He gives us his word. I don't know. That just staggers my mind. Okay. So God knows that we live in a time when people claim all kinds of things as true. People claim to be all kinds of things they are not. And so God notes here in in 1 John 1, if the things that you're claiming are not actually true, then the only person that's really being fooled is yourself. I mean, God's not fooled and other people aren't fooled. If you were to claim that you are sinless, trust me when I tell you, I would know differently. And if I claimed that I were sinless, you would know differently. And so would everybody else. We would be living in a fantasy. We would not be living in the truth. The lies we tell and the lies we tell ourselves um, matter because God is truth, true truth. Truth is a person. He has a name. It is Jesus. Sometimes we like to imagine that truth could be reduced to some set of ideas or even a game, but truth is one of those foundational realities of life. Along with beauty and goodness, truth is one of the three transcendental virtues of reality itself. You cannot escape the truth. You can deny the truth. You can walk away from the truth. You can scorn the truth, but you cannot redefine it. You are not in a position to define what is and is not true. You cannot be your own truth. You cannot claim your own way or your own worldview as the truth because guess what? Truth is a person. Truth is defined by God. You can either accept or reject him, but he is not changing to accommodate your delusions. There is truth and there are lies. There is a personification of truth, Jesus, and there is a manifestation of lies, Lucifer. You're free to choose to follow either one as your master, but only one of them is truly your friend. Read John chapter 10 today. Read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 today. Read Romans chapter 1 today. This this reality of suppressing the truth that is addressed in 1 John 1, 8 and 9, this reality of truth suppression and its consequences, it's dealt with throughout the scriptures. So again, from 1 John 1, if we claim we have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves and we're not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to God, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all wickedness. I hope you choose to live with me in the truth today. Our brother Than Bennett is going to join us next. We're going to continue talking about that which is good and beautiful and true. And yeah, we'll start with him with the truth. You're listening to Mornings with Carmen. What is true? What is good? What is beautiful? Those are the uh, talking and walking points at the Equipped newsletter. Than Bennett is joining us now. He is also host of the Equipped right here on the Faith Radio Network. Good morning, Than. Carmen, my friend, how are you this morning? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I went as well with my soul. How about you? Oh, wow. Amen and amen. I love your opening line. I would I would answer your question that I just, I, I, I'm living a wash in grace and mercy. Carmen, I have been uh, forgiven, and that forgiveness, that mercy, it allows me to live uh, from a place of power, love, and sound mind. It, it's one that uh, enables me to not stay down, but to rise up and represent uh, that gospel in the world around us. So uh, I love it. That is so good. I'm taking notes. That is that is so so good. Um, I'm living in fellowship with um, with other believers. I found I find um, that is such a great encouragement and and great way to live. Um, all right the the newsletter this week is as always so so good. Um, if you guys want me to text you the direct link for this week's equipped newsletter, the equipped newsletter um, dot com. I'm happy to do that. Just text me eight seven seven nine three three two four Eight four Than. Let's start with the true. Um, transformation is a two way street. Tell us about that. 
Yeah, so your wonderful producer, Paul, was teasing me that I was writing about Transformers in the True this morning. and <laughs> Not quite, but although not that far off either. You know, Carmen, um, the True this week and the Beautiful are connected to each other. In the True, we talk about uh, the two-way street of transformation. And, you know, I think when, at least when I think about transformation and, and God's transformation in me, I, I think about the work that he did inside me. And, you know, that is a, um, that that's right. That's correct. He found me in a place where I was lacking. He searched me out. He uh, accepted me as I was, but then he laid the perfection of his son, Jesus Christ over me. And that's now what he sees in me. That's an amazing transformation. And it's one that I should uh, revel in. We should, we should constantly be growing in our knowledge of that first part of, of the transformation. But in the truth this week, I focus on the second side of transformation and, and really a second aspect of that change that happens in us that, that needs to be present if we have truly been transformed. And it's, it's one that doesn't maybe uh, as immediately jump to mind, but it's the truth that my transformation is intended by God to be the transformation of others. You know, I, I have been transformed in other that others might be transformed as well. And we, we take a look in, in the newsletter version. We don't have time to fully unpack it on the broadcast this morning, but I really encourage folks to, to check it out. It's at the equippednewsletter.com. But it's Romans 12, Carmen. And mm. the verse of Romans 12 that comes immediately to my mind, probably comes immediately to the mind of most of your listeners, is verse 2. It's the one that says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Wonderful, wonderful promise. It's right that 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 comes to mind. But the other 19 verses of Romans Mm -hmm. 12, Carmen, they talk about the second part. They talk about the second part of this transformation. It says, you know, it starts out with the first one. Why are we to be transformed? We're be to transform so that we can offer ourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. And then the closing 18 verses talk about how that transformation should result in how we interact with others. We should serve them. We should prioritize them above ourselves. We should love and honor them. And we should live in harmony with them, whether they are friend or they are enemy. And so I just I just want us to think about that second aspect of transformation this week. There is a multiplication attribute of God's grace, his mercy, and his salvation. We were blessed in order that we bless. We we were saved in order that others might be saved. And we were loved in order that others would know uh, that love. And that, that so often comes through service. Yes, we were transformed internally, but we were transformed internally in part so that others could be transformed as well. I can't help but think as you're talking about this, that the day is going to come. The day is going to come. I guess I'm thinking here about like what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, um, verse 12, the day is going to come. I mean, even though right now we see in a mirror dimly or in a glass darkly, then we shall see face to face. Like there's a further transformation yet ahead. Um, Mm -hmm. Even though, you know, now I am living as a new creation and I'm being conformed by one degree of glory to another more into the likeness of Christ, that I am seeking for um, uh, my life uh, to be transformed by the renewing of my mind as you um, you know, as you point to there in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, uh, and then all of the ways that that process is affected uh, in, in real life, the other 19 verses of Romans chapter 12, that is all so good and great. And then I am looking forward. I am looking forward to this reality of knowing fully, even as I am already fully known, because that's, that's a sort of love at its deepest reality. Um, This transformation process isn't, you know, some like mean thing that God is trying to do because he wants Autobots. Uh, Back to your Transformers analogy. (laughs) Um, But but God wants us to be real. He wants to love us real. He wants us to know him and ourselves and everyone else fully, even as he already knows us in that way. Like this transformation process is individual, but it's also relational and then finally corporate. And it just, I think that just boggles the human mind and is so far beyond what we can grasp. I I am so encouraged, Carmen, that this 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 work that I know that God is doing in me, that I feel him doing in me, it doesn't end 
with me, Carmen. It is, like you said, it's meant to be lived out in community. I spent some time in Ecclesiastes uh, chapter four this week, where it talks about two being better than one because they have a good return for their labor. And that if one falls down, the other can help them up. And you know, I, I'll just be honest. This this is why I love partnering with Faith Radio, though, Carmen, because there aren't very many places where the business model, the business plan is truly one of standing together on the truth of God's word. And the reason that's the case is because it's not an easy business model to execute. But Carmen, it is what we need in order for this truth that has been poured into us to be offered to uh, the world around us. So yeah, that, that, that communal aspect of the work that God is doing in us, I think if we don't walk in that, if we don't realize it, Carmen, we we don't actually know the fullness of God's goodness because it was offered not as an end point to us. We're not supposed to be that reservoir. We're supposed to be a conduit. And we don't know the fullness unless we learn and, and are continually growing in the grace of how to pass it on. I just, I love that. We, that leads us, that could lead us to a whole conversation about like the theology of the body, but we'll leave it right there today because we have other things um, that we want to lift up from the equipped newsletter. We're going to continue our conversation with Than Bennett here in just a moment. You are listening uh, to Faith Radio, and we do have a business model. That business model is a listener supported. You are in in this ministry with us. This is your ministry as those who financially make this ministry possible. Next week, we're going to have our Faith Radio Spring Fundraiser, so uh, appreciate it if you would begin praying about what God has sown into your life that He intends for you to sow into this ministry, that the ministry could not only be strong in the days in which we live, but um, but that it would that it would last years and years and decades into the future. 75 years ago, the people who gave the money to start it all, um, you know, they're very likely not around uh, in, in the flesh, but they, but they are a part of the great cloud of witnesses that's still making this ministry happen. So grateful to God for the body today, grateful um, for this opportunity, grateful for Than. We're going to return uh, in just a moment. We're going we're gonna to talk about um, an eternal perspective on what is happening in the Middle East you may have heard that over the weekend, um, Israel did retaliate, uh, and so we're going to talk about that. Um, we're going to talk about that next. You're listening to Mornings with Carmen. I'm Carmen LaBerge, host of Mornings with Carmen. I love a good story, don't you? I love a good love story, a good mystery, a good travel log. I love a good turnaround story or a story that begins once upon a time and ends with happily ever after. So, what's your story? Specifically, your Jesus story. What difference does Jesus make in your life? Could you tell it as a love story or a rescue story? However you tell it, trust me, we want to hear it. We love a good story. Connecting Faith to Life, Faith Radio. Sure is beautiful out there. And uh, sure is getting beautiful inside you as God brings his power to bear in your life and brings you more into conformity with um, with that which is truly beautiful, his son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. We're talking with Than Bennett. He is host of The Equipped here on the Faith Radio Network. He also writes The Equipped Newsletter. I encourage you to check that out at theequippednewsletter.com. Um, Than, lots going on uh, in the world. Over the weekend, as you know, Iran directly attacked Israel, but her defenses and her friends proved sufficient to that challenge. And then last night, Israel directly attacked Iran, Israel's um, strike targeted Iran's nuclear facilities, um, but, you know, it's a pretty tit-for-tat in terms of um, of Israel's response. No damage done on the ground in Israel by Iran over the weekend, and Iran claims no damage done um, to, to their facilities um, through the drone attack by Israel last night. So it would seem that each are saying to the other, um, we can get to you. Um, what what are you making of what is happening between Iran and Israel? What's your analysis and eternal perspective? Well, first of all, uh, just in a little bit of analysis, I mean, there, it's no doubt that these uh, multiple interactions are escalations. But I, I think the first observation I would make, Carmen, is that there's really not a change in the players here. And this is one of the things that we've been writing at, about at the Equip, just, just in a, a reality of who attacked Israel back on October 7th. In very, very many respects, it was Iran. Hamas has been a, a, a proxy of Iran and a 
Uh, Iran has been their sponsor for violence uh, for many years now. And it has, it's a fact that is known around the world. And so, yes, the attacks of this week were the first direct involvement of Iran that they claimed. But even dating back to the attacks of October 7th, Iran has been implicated in this. And so we have sort of been able to see this day coming. Um, and I would just say for, for an eternal uh, perspective and what, what I'm asking readers of the equipped and listeners of the equipped to do is to continue to view all of the developments of this story through a biblical framework that we laid out all the way back in October. There are four points. I've got the link on uh, the the website on the newsletter, but um, there's tension within this framework, Carmen, but as it relates to these uh, developments, there's a couple of them that I really want to pull out. First of all, an authority, including a governing authority, has a sacred duty to protect those within their charge. And so when you hear calls that uh, maybe Israel shouldn't respond, maybe Israel should uh, not respond to those who are perpetually threatening them. I think that violates a, a biblical tenet that we find in Romans 13, 4. And then maybe just one more, uh, the actions of other world powers and specifically world powers like the United States, they have a direct involvement in how these stories play out. And so it's easy to think about this as something that is happening a world away. But uh, when when the when an ally is attacked, when an ally is under threat, the actions and our response, or maybe how we even consider a threat like Iran, Carmen, it has a direct impact on how this plays out. And so I just encourage each, each of us grapple with, um, you know, my particular framework is not mine, but it is rooted in biblical concepts. And I think we as Jesus followers uh, have an obligation and an invitation to view it uh, through uh, that lens of authority. I appreciate that that's what you're giving us at the Equip. You're giving us a, a lens through which to see and understand what's happening in the world around us. So touch on the eternal flame, the uh, uh, 2024 Olympic Games officially, um, I mean, officially underway in terms of the, the torch. So uh, I, I really appreciated your analysis and eternal perspective on this one. Yeah, I, I love the Olympics, Carmen. I do. I mean, it's one of my earliest memories, actually. We we actually purchased a black and white television for the first time in 1988, and I watched my first Olympics. I love the Olympics. Uh, the Olympics this year are in Paris. They will begin in July, but the the flame has been lit. And the, the, the tradition here is that the flame gets lit in Olympia, where the Olympics began, and then it will journey uh, to Paris and arrive for the opening ceremony. But I just got things thinking about some of the symbolism of the Olympic torch. And, you you know, you got to be a little bit careful here. Some of the symbolism certainly draws on um, uh, powers that are not eternally true. But there there's an aspect of it that speaks very closely to analogies that are used all throughout Scripture. And that is that this is an eternal flame. And that is verbiage that God uses multiple times throughout Scripture. You know, God himself is described as a consuming fire. That happens uh, frequently throughout Scripture. And then God's judgment, of course, is described as an eternal fire. Um, And then you actually referenced this just a moment ago, but just as the flame is meant to be a a sort of a nod to uh, games of ancient times, we are supposed to be inspired by Jesus followers who have gone before us. We find that in Hebrews 12, like you said, it's called uh, the great cloud of witnesses. And so as we watch this torch journey toward Paris and we think about how it is described as an eternal flame, I want us to be reminded of a God that is a consuming fire, a judgment that he has offered us uh, offered us relief from, and then also to stand on the shoulders of those who have gone before us in the faith. I think all of those uh, analogies and connections are things that we can draw from this story. Fan, um, you know, I never want to let you go before we talk about the beautiful. And let me just say that the beautiful this week is, you know, every week it's worth seeing in the Equipped Newsletter. But this week um, it is a picture of new life. Tell us what we're going to see um, and tell us what you see beyond what we see. 
Carmen, I am going to spend more time on the beautiful in this week's broadcast than I usually do. It will probably be the longest segment. Um, We are in springtime and we are used to that showing new signs of life, right? We see the flowers come back. We see that the leaves come back on the trees and much of that life is coming back in places where it has been before, right? The perennial flowers are coming up uh, where they've been in the past. But here, here's the beauty that I want us to take into the world with us uh, this week. There is also a spread of spring life every year where color comes up in places where it has never before been. And here's what I want us to realize. That only happens because of autumn's death. It is only because of something that died last autumn and then the seeds spread to new places that that color is now evident in new places. And this is true in our lives as well. There was, there was once death in your life, Carmen. There was, there was death in mind, but, but here's the, the truth and the beauty that we're, we're standing on this week. That winter is gone, and the spring of God's rebirth in us, us has come. It is evident in places where it has never before been, and I just want to read very quickly. I know we're pressed on time, but Song of Songs, songs 2, 10 through 13, listen to this. My beloved spoke and said to me, arise, my darling, my beautiful one, come with me. See, the winter is past. The rains are over and gone. Flowers appear on the earth. The season of singing has come. The cooing of doves is heard in our land. The fig tree forms its early truth, uh, fruit. The blossoming vines spread their fragrance. And listen to this. Arise, come, my darling, my beautiful one, come with me. Carmen, there is life in new places for each of your listeners. If we will take notice of it, and even if it comes from a place of death in our life previously, that is part of the way we connect to the truth that we started on today. That is how others come face to face with God's beauty. Than, what a gift. Um, Thank you so much for being with us today. The Equipped Newsletter. Uh, is available for you, as is The Equipped, which is a show that Than hosts here on the Faith Radio Network. You can connect with uh, with Than at MyFaithRadio.com through um, through the program The Equipped and, um, and obviously online at The Equipped Newsletter as well. Than, as always, thank you so much, brother. Carmen, we love and appreciate you. What is, uh, what is God awakening in you today as you wake up to the realities of the days in which we live? You're listening to Mornings with Carmen. I'm Carmen LeBurge. We're going to continue our conversation here in just a moment. Have you ever tried to fly blind? I mean, like flying blind. Have you ever tried to drive blind? I just don't recommend these things. Um, so I'm flying blind at the moment, but my friend Dan DeWitt is going to take the wheel and he's going to drive. Good morning. Good morning, Dan. Good morning, I Carmen. What's I can't see anything. I can't see anything. It all disappeared a moment ago on my screen. So all I know no. right this minute, all I know right this minute <laughs> is that I'm talking to my friend Dan DeWitt and he's going to drive the car. Dan, what, what's crack and lagging? Yeah, totally, right? Yeah. It's never go. happened before. This. this has never happened before. <laughs> I normally I normally I mean, I say normally. I used to print out a paper backup. Like I used to like so I would have a crutch. And I stopped doing that because right, the internet is so reliable. <laughs> yeah. How how'd that work uh, out for you, Carmen? <laughs> yeah. So this morning I'm I'm feeling like I like all of a sudden I'm sweating. Anyway, there's a lot going on. There's a lot going on, Dan. Um, where are you? What's happening? And what are we talking about? All right. So I am in Ohio. I just got back from um, Southwest Baptist University, where I lead the Center for Worldview and Culture in Bolivar, Missouri. And it's good to be home for a short while. I'm going to be heading back to Missouri to speak for the National Gathering of the Baptist Bible Fellowship International, which is a um, denomination, a collection of independent Baptist churches. So I'm glad to be home for a little bit. And then when I get back from that trip, Carmen, I'm going to Ireland and England, where I'm going to be teaching my C.S. Lewis class. And yes, I live a super privileged life. I'm really excited about that trip. And today, you've asked me to talk about a few different things. And one of them that Paul included in his email, which you can't see, and I can. I guess I could talk about whatever I want to talk about right now because you wouldn't know, right? So, no. So. Here's, uh, so God. So God's at work. Um, how can heaven be good if people I love aren't there? Uh huh. I have. Oh. I. 
I have arrived back. <laughs> Look I, at you. I am, my notes are restored. My notes are restored. I do think this is a legit question. Like you, you are asking yeah. such an important, legitimate question. Um, I actually know people who are resisting. They are resisting the gospel because people who they have loved over the course of life were not believers. And so if they embrace the gospel, mm. then they are afraid that they are facing a prospect of eternity without people they love. So, yeah, how can heaven be good if people I love aren't there? Well, so in in one sense, I would say humanly, it is absolutely, I would just empathize with anybody with that feeling. And we all have it in some way about some person or a collection of people or humanity in general, right? Um, mm -hmm. But it's humanly impossible. So Revelation 21 talks about this divine future act in which God will wipe away every tear from every eye. And I, I, on my blog, I have a link to a video where I respond to, I spoke at a large Christian school in Northwest Arkansas two weeks ago and like 1500 kids in the school, which is big for a Christian school. And we, when I'm asked to speak for Christian school assemblies, um, it's probably, to be honest, Carmen, I'm letting everyone in on a secret. My least favorite place to go speak is typically a Christian school chapel. Um, and so usually what I'll ask is, can I do Q&A? Because I find that mm -hmm. students who are often surrounded by a lot of God talk, a lot of Bible classes, sometimes it's all background noise. But if you'll just turn it over to them and say, I actually want to hear what you what's on your mind. Um, mm -hmm. And so I... I, res I responded to as many questions as I could during the program time. And then I had the uh, Campus Life pastor email me a list of questions, and this was one of them. And so my answer to it is, is pretty simple. It's humanly impossible, but there is a divine future act, which is the only way it's possible, is through God, and which he'll wipe away every tear so that our experience in the new cre creation, in the new heavens and the new earth, will not be overshadowed by grief of any kind. Um, and it, I also think about how Jesus describes that there will not be marriage or giving a marriage in heaven, I think mm -hmm. is also an insight into this, that there is somehow a love that transcends all of our human categories, so much so that somehow, in a way that doesn't rationally make sense to me now, we will spend our days in the new heavens and the new earth without grief. And that includes the fact that there will be loved people, people we love who are not there. It's unthinkable on this side of the new creation, but somehow in the new creation, um, we will be filled with joy in his presence. As I think of Psalm 1611, in your presence, there is fullness of joy and at your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Um, there's a there's sort of a an ancillary question to the one about you know how how can heaven be good if people I love aren't there? Um, I know that my husband is among those people who are so looking forward to meeting, um, you know, meeting his babies who hmm. are in heaven, um, you know, who he never got to meet because, you know, they they were miscarried um, before mm -hmm. that you know, before they came into this world. And so um, if we spend time thinking of the people who we have loved who are in heaven and the people who love God who are in heaven, who we've never had the opportunity yet to meet, um, you know, I do think, I do think that the categories of brother and sister and the categories of mm -hmm. all being a part of the bride of Christ and the, um, and everybody falling down in worship before you know, the Lamb of God, like, I, I just, I think that getting us um, to begin to imagine that which we can only imagine, um, maybe as a part of the invitation here. I'm, I'm super interested to know, what are some of the other questions they ask? Like, what, what are the kids asking these days? What do they want to know? Well, you know, it's when you do Q&A in venues like that, and whether it's at a out college outreach event or a youth camp I might be speaking at or a Christian school, the questions all kind of fall into some pretty typical buckets. And so one of them always deals with pain and suffering. Um, and so how how can God be good in light of all the suffering? And again, these are questions that are 
you know, to use a philosophical term, they're existential in nature. We are trying to make mm-hmm. sense of our existence in the world. And one of the things I, I try to do is to empathize with the question. And so for that question, I'll often ask, you know, respond with the question, not looking you know, rhetorically, uh, how much energy would it take God right now to clear St. Jude's Children's Hospital? Mm. Zero. And that's a hard question to live with. Even harder if it's one of your, yeah. if it's your child or grandchild or loved one there. And so we have to wrestle with that. And I feel like sometimes we sugarcoat um, the questions or we kind of sterilize them. And so we have to, we have to live in that moment and to say that we are between Jesus's resurrection and our future resurrection, which means death is, is ahead for, for us and those we love. So that's a big question that comes up all the time. I think that intellectually it's dealt with easily theologically, like the Bible gives us really clear answer. We live in a fallen world. God will make all things new, but in the moment, you know, we, it's not, it's not an intellectual question. It's an emotional right. and personal question. And so that one, and then an interesting one, I had several students, I'd made a comment using a C.S. Lewis uh, illustration that I think is powerful about Hamlet getting to know Shakespeare, which could only be through Shakespeare's doing. And um, I made the comment um, that God has written himself into our story. And I think I borrowed that from Tim Keller, his use of the, the Lewis illustration. And I had several students say, you know what, what exactly they wanted to understand better what that means for God to take on flesh. And they've heard that numerous times, but what does that really mean for God to have, for God to be God and man? And so that was a big one. Um, why should I trust the Bible stuff, stuff like the kind of things you would expect. And then probably the the thing that's more common and recurrent um, today than it would have been maybe 20 years ago would be identity issues. You know, how do I mm-hmm. think about my own identity? What about my friends who are experiencing dysphoria over not feeling at home in their own body, trying to make sense of their day? Those are always those are always questions that students have. That's so good. Thank you for giving us um, those insights. We're talking with Daniel DeWitt. Uh, he serves as a senior senior fellow at Southwest Baptist University. You can check out what he's writing at Theo Latte dot com. We like to check in um, with Dan on uh, not only what he's writing, but what he's thinking about and, um, you know, the world that God has him walking around in as an agent of grace uh, and minister of reconciliation. Um, I do want to talk about these temporary tears in just a moment, but maybe when we come back, we could touch on the eclipse science and ultimate reality. Could we do that? We can do that. The week, mm-hmm. Let's talk about the eclipse that changed the world. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about the eclipse that changed the world. Um, that's up next. You're on Mornings with Carmen. 150 million people, 150 million people actively use one particular app every month in the United States of America. I want that to be the Faith Radio app. How about you? If you're wondering how you could be encouraged in your faith at any time, anywhere, well, I got good news for you. There's literally an app for that. You can listen to Faith Radio live any show on demand, no matter where you are at any time of the day or night, download the free Faith Radio app right now. It's super easy. Just text the word app to 877-933-2484 and click the link. Let's connect faith to life. Did you see the eclipse? Were you in the path of totality? Um, Have you at least seen pictures um, and stories and heard people tell tales? My uh, granddaughter, Evelyn, is 10. So although she saw the 2017 eclipse, she doesn't really remember it. This one she saw, and now she's got tales to tell. How about you? Dan DeWitt is here. Um, You can find what we're talking about today at theolatte.com. Daniel, let's talk about the eclipse um, and the eclipse that changed the world. Yes, the eclipse that changed the world, and I am in the total, the totality. So, in here in near Dayton, Ohio, we were able to, you know, see the sun completely blocked out, and yet the those, you know, few seconds where you could actually take your glasses off because you couldn't with the glasses on, you couldn't see anything, you know, when the sun was completely blocked out. Um, but the eclipse I'm speaking about is an eclipse that took place at the end of May, the 28th day of May. 
in the year 585 BC. And the reason that eclipse is important and what I'm sharing is somewhat contested, although there seems to be a general consensus that there was a individual who 600 years, nearly 600 years before the birth of Christ, there was an individual who was able to study um, nature and predict a total uh, eclipse. And that person was a Greek philosopher whose name was Thales. And it's a big deal, so much so that Isaac Asimov, who's the the famous science fiction author who was also a professor of, I believe, biochemistry at Boston University. So an academic who also wrote for a popular culture. But Isaac Asimov says that that is the day that science was born because Thales didn't consult um, a religious writing. He didn't have religious experience. He just studied nature and was able to predict this eclipse. So on that day, science was born, according to Asimov. And so I think it's important for us to think about the study of the natural world, but that particular occurrence is interesting to me because the people interpreted this natural event that was predicted through the scientific method, we might say, um, they interpreted it as a supernatural sign. And so it's an illustration of two things. On the one hand, the capacity of the human mind to study the natural world, but then on the other hand, that we always have to bring to these natural events an interpretation. And so for Thales, he was also known as saying, know thyself. Now, I, I wrote this piece because I think it's just interesting, particularly in light of our recent clips. But I also think it's interesting that there is, on the one hand, a natural way we could study the world, but we're still left with bigger questions that science can't touch. And for Thales, he believed ultimately, his ultimate theory that he brought to his interpretation, as we all do, I mean, there are no really there are no self, there are no such things as self interpreting facts. There are facts, and then we have to look at them and interpret them. And so, for Thales, his way of seeing the world, what we would call worldview, is that there was one essence that defined all of reality, and that was water. That what was really real behind everything else was water. And you might think his theory is all wet. Forgive the pun, um, but water gave a good option. Because water can be a solid, it could be a liquid, or it could be a gas. It seems to contain in itself motion. If you look at the, the ocean and the, the tide, it seems to have all the things you would need for a theory of ultimate reality. So in looking up and trying to understand the world and understand himself, that's what he came away with. For the Christian, however, I'm reminded of Psalm 8, in which David begins and ends the psalm in the same way. He's looking up at the heavens, and he begins with, O Lord, our Lord. How excellent is your name in all the earth? He ends the psalm that way. And in the middle of the psalm, he asks the question, what is man? So this eclipse that started science, according to some, um, is a reminder that as helpful as science is, as much as we can learn in our own abilities, we're always going to be left with the question, who am I? And for the Christian, we frame that question with a God who has revealed himself to us in time, space, matter, and energy through the incarnation of Jesus and through scripture. That was a mouthful. No, that's so good. Um, I, one of the things that I learned during this, you know, kind of exercise of the, of the total solar eclipse that we experienced here in North America is that there are between two and five, at least partial solar eclipses every single year and a total eclipse taking place every 18 months or so somewhere. So um, when we talk about the predictive power I mean, we talk about being able to, like, figure it out scientifically. Um, you know, this, it only affects uh, the people who are in its path. And you have to be like, mm -hmm. I mean, as we now all know, I mean, if you don't drive fast enough into the band of totality, you miss it. It's not it's mm -hmm. not the same. Um, and so, uh, I mean, even when we're talking about uh, the 28th day of the month of May, 585 B.C., we're doing that from our perspective, right? We're, and so when we talk about yeah. a solar eclipse or a total solar eclipse, we're absolutely talking about it from our perspective. And that is so limited. I think that's a part of this conversation as well. It's so limited. Um, and absolutely. so, you know, is there going to be another uh, total eclipse, you know, where I live um, within my lifetime? Well, I mean, depends how long I live, right? But um, here, was a, here was a sentence that struck me um, 
that these total solar eclipses are seen every 400 years from any one place on the surface of the Earth. Well, that's a long hmm. time. And so yeah. it's not like <laughs> it's not like any one person is going to be around to see many of them if you if you even get to see one. And I think that's why so many people over the course of history and maybe even today regard them as supernatural. Like, right. I mean, I it's and it is supernatural in, in the sense that God's the one who orchestrates it all, created it all. Um, yeah. Anyway, and there's eclipses in the Bible, and I think those are worth studying as well. Yeah, the the predictive power of science is is really amazing. That God created us with this capacity to study the world and make sense of the world, um, but we're still left with those questions, like David staring up at the stars in Psalm eight. Mm -hmm. You know, who am I? And like you said, I've a I've got a link to an article um, called "What Is Lived Experience," and it's with a philosophy magazine, but it's looking at the way that we all, you know, for some people, they didn't see the eclipse because of where they live in the world. We all have these mm. different lived experiences. Um, however, there are perennial human questions that, that's, that are universal. And we're all trying to figure this out together. And either there is there is no top-down information. There's, there's nothing from outside of our world to tell us what the design for the world is. Um, and in that case, we just have the best we could do is from our limited vantage point to try and make sense of it all and to try and bring to our lives some meaning and value. But for David, he finds great comfort in looking up at the stars, knowing that a Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name, that he answers the question of who am I in the framework of not bottom-up information exclusively, what we get through science, but top-down information, this God who has revealed himself. <laughs> Uh, I do. Uh, I do love you, Derek, listening right now um, and saying, S, not only are you, did you have a technology failure, but we were all listening just to make things worse. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Daniel, thank you for walking with me um, this morning in this conversation. Thank you for all that you do each and every day to shepherd the hearts and minds of young people. Um, thank you for still standing in awe of God hmm. and the created universe. Um, and thank you for helping us make some of these really important connections. You guys can read um, what Daniel is writing and connect with him at theolatte.com. Uh, for those of you just tuning in, you are listening to Mornings with Carmen. I'm Carmen LeBurge. This is the Faith Radio Network. Welcome to those of you maybe listening for the very first time in Billings, Montana. We recognize that, um, you know, the signal that you're listening to there, that radio tower, uh, you know, it's changed format. And so we want to know, we want you to know, like where you are now, who's talking, uh, you know, who are you hearing, what's going on? So visit with us at myfaithradio.com. You can check out um, all the resources that we have available. We've got all kinds of things that you can um, that you can use to grow in your faith and to walk humbly each and every day with the Lord our God. We want you to be equipped. We want you to be encouraged. We want you to be empowered to walk your faith out into the world that God so loves and to do so in ways that honor Jesus. So that's what we're doing here at Faith Radio. We love that you are with us and that we're with you um, each and every hour of every day. This is listener-supported media. And uh, and so whether you tune in online at MyFaithRadio.com or on the Faith Radio app or listening on a live radio signal somewhere across the upper Midwest or into Hartford, Connecticut, or now westward to Billings, Montana, we love you. We with you. We're with you. We're for you in the spirit of Jesus. Um, so thank you so much for sharing this time together today. We got another hour of Mornings with Carmen up next. Thanks for listening to Mornings with Carmen LeBurge. Podcasts like this are available because of your support. If it's important to you to hear things that encourage your faith, click the link in the show notes to give now. And thanks.